Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour on Saga 960. So a week ago, we heard the news of uh, the finding of a mass grave um, at a residential school in British Columbia. Um, and I really wanted to reach out to uh, someone who I respect. Uh, I had the privilege of interviewing him uh, almost a year ago, Brad Regeer, who is the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association. He's a lawyer um, in uh, Winnipeg, I believe it is. Uh, Brad, is it not? Yeah, that's correct. And, um, and Brad, you wanted to say something about uh, how you felt and, uh, and, and, and you had a message for, uh, for Canadians and, and Indigenous people as well in regards to uh, this finding. So uh, welcome to our show. Um, tell us uh, how you're feeling and what you're thinking. Um, well, you know, <clears throat> well, first of all, thanks for having me here. Uh, uh, earlier this uh, week, I issued a press release uh, 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 from the Bar Association, and I also issued an op-ed uh, in our national magazine on uh, the finding in Kamloops. I, you know, was certainly aware of what was said and heard during the Truth and Reconciliation Commission hearings. I remember being at the opening, one of the opening ceremonies in Winnipeg back in 2010. Um, you know, and, and at the time I thought I, I couldn't even fathom if one of my sons uh, had, or all of them had been taken away from me, you know, when they were four or five years old. It's just, it, I, I can't, I can't compute it in my head. And, you know, I've been talking about the TRC calls to action They've been around for almost six years. Two years ago, we had the calls to justice and the missing and murdered indigenous women and girls inquiry. Uh, but something, something hit me and hit a lot of other people a week and a half ago when the announcement was made that they had found 215 bodies unmarked, uh, unmarked graves and they were all children. Um, I think for a lot of people, this was always real, but it was always people saying, well, there's unmarked graves and, and we didn't, it's, it's like we didn't have the proof. Um, but we do have the proof that what survivors were talking about uh, during the TRC process is true. And, and Kamloops isn't the first place, but it's, it's so poignant, it's so, it's so raw for so many people. And, you know, I, when you interviewed me last year, uh, you know, I talked about being a 60 scoop kid and I only got to know my biological family once I was older. And, and I have indigenous friends who grew up in an urban area and, you know, nice neighborhoods, middle class neighborhoods, you know. Um, none of us went to residential school. We all got to go to nice schools and got to go to university, but something has something. I mean, I guess they call it a triggering event. I don't know. Um, but but it, it it it's really raw and it's it it's also non-indigenous people my my adopted mother um i've talked to her a number of times about this she said it's uh, it's giving her nightmares it's making her sick to her stomach um that 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 this is you know that this happened um i've had friends who have come up to me and they're just uh they're really upset about this it's it's uh, it, it, it it's hitting a lot of canadians I think that a lot of Canadians just didn't think that Canadians were capable of anything close to this. And, you know, you hear some stories and maybe it's a, a, a one-off kind of a situation and it doesn't hit you, but 215 certainly hits you unbelievably hard. And it's a, it's an issue that, that you just can't set aside. And to think that, um, you know, our, 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 forebears in Canada could commit anything like this is disgusting, isn't it? It's, it's, it's almost unfathomable. Um, you know, and this, this went on for, for decades and decades because the schools go back to the 1900, 19th century. Um, but this has triggered more and more stories this Things people talked about during the TRC process, is, it's coming back now. And here in Manitoba, we it's now come out in Brandon. There was a residential school there. They know where there are some graves and uh, unmarked, and then they know there are more. But the city of Brandon sold off a bunch of that land to a, to a uh, private campground uh, and told them, "Well, you just you have to take care of this area because it's a, it's a graveyard." And apparently, they put in camping sites over top of them. 
uh, now there's calls for that land to be taken back and, uh, and, and to find where all these children are buried. And, and that's just another one, but there's, so, there's just so many more, so many more stories coming up. Brad, what's, what's your message to, uh, to Indigenous people? Um, that are going through, as you say, a triggering event and, and, and sort of having to deal with what's going on. Yeah, I, I, I would say you're not alone in this. Um, there's, a, there's a lot of survivors, there's families of survivors. Um, you know, the Indigenous community is there for each other. Uh, this has impacted the, the Indigenous community in Canada at large, uh, First Nations, Métis, Inuit communities have all been impacted by this, urban communities, um, rural communities. Uh, I would just say, you know, be there for each other. And there are supports that are available. I'm, I'm, I'm very happy and heartened to see that when I see stories in the media uh, or um, organizations commenting on it, so they're, 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 they're including 1-800 numbers where people can call uh, to get support, and I encourage people to take advantage of those and and, and to utilize those those services. This is uh, this is having a big impact on a lot of people. We're chatting tonight with Brad Regeer. He is the uh, president of the Canadian Bar Association, and happens to be the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association. Um, about what happened in uh, in Kamloops, or at least what we discovered uh, last week, uh, what happened in Kamloops. 215 uh, people, uh, children found in a in a grave, uh, unmarked grave uh, at a residential school. We're going to take a break uh, for some messages and come back more with Brad in just a minute. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crombie Radio Hour. It's a um, a different kind of a show today because we're chatting about uh, the finding at the residential school uh, out in uh, Kamloops, British Columbia, uh, where 215 uh, children, uh, the graves for 215 children were found um, uh, at a residential school. And I think um, it's really uh, brought to people's mind, uh, to their uh, awareness, um, a, a very sad part of, uh, of Canadian history. And we're joined with uh, tonight with Brad, by Brad Regeer, who is the president of the Canadian Bar Association, the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association. Bar Association. Uh, Brad, you know, I did a whole bunch of shows about just a week, just about a year ago today um, on uh, race relations in the United States. And, uh, and it was following, uh, you know, obviously what had happened. And, and a lot of people talked about George Floyd and the killing as being a triggering event uh, uh, in the United States, but that it really improved things maybe uh, because people came to a, a recognition of uh, police brutality and, and race relations in the United States like they had not before. And, and I'm reminded by, I think it was former president uh, Abraham Lincoln in the United States that said slavery in the United States was the original sin of, uh, of America. Um, do you think the original sin of Canada was how Canadians have treated uh, our Indigenous uh, brothers and sisters? Um, I, I think that is an arguable point to make. Uh, the, just, just the way Indigenous people have been treated in Canada. And, you know, you could, you could add in the United States there, you could add in Mexico, Central and South America. Um, it's, it has stained the, the, the vision of Canada. Uh, you know, the way Canada gets portrayed in the world. When this stuff, you, you bring this up, I don't think Canada is the squeaky clean, has the squeaky clean image that you know, we all want to believe that Canada has, uh, you know, if, if you want to talk about original sin, I mean, I just can't, I can't think of, and, and, and don't get me wrong, there has been problems with uh, treatment of other um, racialized groups in Canada. Uh, you know, we've had issues on how women have been treated. Um, uh, hom the way homosexuals have been treated, but the way indigenous people have been treated <clears throat> and have been treated for centuries now it's just it you sit there and you go 
why? Why, why did this have to happen? I, and, and why on so many levels? And it's, and it's continuing because the federal government, provincial governments just continually fight indigenous people. Um, despite all of the claims of reconciliation, I'm a practicing lawyer and the firm I work at, the main you know, opposing party we have in our practice is the government of Canada. And they just, they just fight Indigenous people on so many things. It's not just historic claims, it's, it's just funding for child welfare on reserve, um, you know, health benefits. Like, I, I, I could I go on. Someone uh, last week who is a water engineer and, uh, and she reviewed with me the number of boiled water advisories in um, different, uh, you know, reservations or indigenous communities or, or whatnot across Canada. We don't have safe drinking water. So many communities don't have safe drinking water. They can't drink it. They shouldn't be bathing in it. Uh, I was shocked I, when she said that they don't, you can't bathe in it. You can't even, like drinking is bad, but, but they can't even have it on your body. It's that yeah. bad. Like what's yeah. going on? I, I mean, I'm not an engineer. I just, I, and, I, and I, I, I can't understand why we can't get them fixed. The only thing that I can understand is that it costs money and it's going to cost a lot of money. But if Canadians um, don't have a right to safe drinking water, like, you know, we talk about a right to healthcare, we talk about a right to education. Shouldn't we have a right to safe drinking water? You would think so because it's pretty basic to our chemistry. We, we all need a certain amount of water every day in order to be alive. Uh, so you think that would be pretty fundamental. Brad, let's go back. Um, when, when, when were residential schools? You said uh, in the 1900s. So this was something after Confederation that uh, was established across Canada in different places? Yeah, it was in the, in the 19th century. Um, and it was uh, very much from the get-go, it was a policy of assimilation. Um, there was the, the quote from John A. Macdonald about uh, we're going to send... The, uh, well, yeah, there was quotes from him, and then there was um, the superintendent of Indian Affairs at the time, where we were going to ha we were going to take the Indian out of the child. Um, we were going to take the Indian out of the child. Yeah. What? A and that was that was a that was official government policy. That phrase was official government policy. And uh, they, you know, had willing partners with the major churches, uh, Roman Catholic, uh, Lutheran, Methodist, um, who, you know, were more than happy to run these schools and convert these children and um, Why? And fulfill. It was, a, uh, it was proselytizing. It was trying to convert them to, the, to Christianity. Is that the justification, if there was any? That would have been their justification at the time. I mean, they uh, they likely also made money off of these uh, running these churches, running these uh, schools. Um, uh, yeah, so that would have been this, this whole mix of assimilation, of proselytization. You know, they they viewed indigenous people as heathens, um, so they're going to bring them into, you know, bring them into the Christian church uh, at any by any means necessary and those means were it's it's horrific it's horrific so this was um you know i i presume violence that was uh it was capital or corporal punishment at least what what there was a uh, the corporal punishment of every and i you know you know if, if someone's listening to this and this is triggering them you know, I said earlier, there are resources and, and uh, you know, uh, I want them to take advantage of that to, to, to use those resources. But, you know, from what I've seen and read, just, just the violence, it was, it was incredible, the amount of violence and the different types. I mean, you read the stories of one, um, I think it was a Canadian senator. Um, she tells a story of a little girl who was, uh, the discipline was to, the priest hit her in the head with a two by four and killed her. Uh, a priest did this. Oh yes, there's all sorts of stories of priests and nuns having killed 
um, uh, or ministers uh, having killed children. Uh, then there was, of course, uh, in addition to the physical abuse, there was the emotional abuse. And of course, there was the sexual abuse that went on at so many of the schools. Uh, that you just, through the testimony, you just hear it from survivor after survivor after survivor talking about all of this abuse that was heaped on these children. And, you know, they, in Kamloops, they, they sort of determined that one of the children was a, was only three years old. And, and, and do we know, like, this is a disgusting conversation, I apologize, but like, do we know why they were killed? Were they sick? Were they beaten? Were they broken bones? Like, do we have any information on any? From what I've, what I've read is they don't, they are not able yet to ascertain that. They have just used the, the ground radar uh, technology to locate the where the bodies are. I don't believe they've they've exhumed any of the bodies or, or done autopsies at this point in time. Is there any supposition? Like you know, like yeah, I can understand. I, I can understand that's a terrible thing to say. I guess you know we've heard so much about uh, sexual assault and 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 corporal punishment and violence, but again, you know, you hear it with one person here or one person there. You don't hear it. Um, with 215, 215 sort of sounds like, you know, Jim Jones and 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 mass murder and 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 genocide almost. Uh, um, and I hate to use that word, but that's what it sort of sounds like. How can 215 children be killed? How is that possible? Because no one cares. No one cared. They were just uh, they were just indigenous children. They weren't. They they were they were not valued. When you when you don't value someone, uh, it becomes easier to do things. I mean, look look what happened in World War II. There was all sorts of people in Europe who were not valued, and look what happened to them. And here, going back into the 19th century, Indigenous children were not they were they weren't seen as valuable. They were seen as disposable, disposable. Um, and, and you know, as I said before, Kamloops is just the first. There there are other other sites out there at other schools. And there's a call that every single school needs to have the ground penetrating radar technology. So I don't, I don't know what it is, but, but uh, that those searches need to be done. And then when that reveals something, uh, further investigation needs to be done. Brad, is forced assimilation genocide? Uh, well, the TRC made a determination that that was an aspect uh, of, of genocide and uh, Given everything that I've seen that has been done to Indigenous peoples, I am firmly of the view that genocide was committed against Indigenous people in Canada. Really? Yeah. Tell us a little bit about your story. Um, you, uh, you said that you were adopted. Um, and uh, I think in our last conversation, you said that you really found your Indigenous roots, you know, not right away after a while. Tell us a little bit about your own story, if you could. Uh, I was uh, part of the 60 scoop. I was adopted as a, a very young child. Uh, I think it was around three months of age. Uh, adopted into a uh, non-Indigenous family. Grew up in a, you know, middle class, working class neighborhood in the south part of Winnipeg. Uh, I've always said that I was one of the lucky ones because I got adopted into a warm, loving family. Um, my mom is still my mom. Uh, you know, uh, I got uh, great siblings. I've got great nieces and nephews on, on that side of my family. But uh, there was always a craving um, on my part to find the people I came from. And I had friends who were also adopted, Indigenous friends who were adopted uh, into non-Indigenous families at, you know, at that time in the 60s and 70s. And um, it was always interesting because I th they all had the same desire uh, to find out more where they came from. And, uh, you know, I, di I didn't know how to do that or how to go about doing that. I mean, I, as a kid, I was a teenager. And then when I was in my early 20s, I, I sort of resolved that I, I'd been learning more about my heritage, but it, it, I was like, I need to, I need to find these people. And uh, through the assistance of some other people, we were able to track down um, the communities where I might have come from and uh, some phone calls were made and they eventually reached out to the um, uh, child and family service worker in Sandy Bay, Saskatchewan, because they knew that the surname Bear 
which was my last name, was popular in that community. And they said, young man, this was his birth name. He's looking for his family. And they were talking to my aunt. And she was, we've been looking for him for a long time. And uh, that was like on a, I remember it was on a Friday uh, in January in 1993, 1994. And uh, I, over the weekend, spoke to uh, my grandmother, lots of uncles and aunts and cousins. And then finally on the Sunday, I was uh, put in contact with my mother. Uh, she, we talked for a bit and then she said, can, can you call me back in a couple of hours? I got to tell your brothers that they don't know anything about you. Uh, I, had, I had two younger brothers. And uh, so then I talked to them that day. Um, they were, I think, blown away to find out that they had another sibling <laughs> that they knew nothing about. And uh, uh, kind of a funny thing to all of that was that on the, on the Monday morning, I had a contracts, uh, a, a midterm in my contracts law course. And I went into the professor's uh, uh, office and I said, so I didn't study for, at all from the midterm, but it's not because I was out partying. Uh, this is what happened. And he just looked at me and he said, you're not writing the midterm. I'll set a new term, midterm for you a week from now. And he said, just go home and get some sleep because you look exhausted. And so, uh, and uh, Professor Osborne to this day uh, will occasionally contact me and ask me how my family's doing. He's, he's since retired and moved back to New Zealand. And when I became president last September, he actually emailed me out of the blue and uh, reminded me of that story that, that, that Monday morning where I came in to talk to him. So. And are you in contact with uh, your your mother, your birth mother, and, and your siblings today? Um, I, I unfortunately I only got to spend five years with my birth mother. She passed away in uh, 1999. Um, I'm sorry to hear that. Uh, thank you. Uh, and, and I miss her. I miss her a lot. Um, especially in the last couple of years, uh, we became quite close. But uh, I have I, I have a I, don't, I always tell people I don't have a family tree. I have a family bush because I have my biological family as well, and I have four older step siblings, one who has since passed away, but uh, two younger brothers. And of course, you know, then with my adopted family and we often will have big gatherings together. Um, my mom, my adopted mom and my one sister in particular um, are, are quite close. Uh, and a really nice thing for me was that when my biological mother was, was not doing well in the last year of her life. Um, I remember her coming over to my adopted mom's place and uh, you know, we were, having, we were having a birthday party or something and uh, there was my adopted mom taking care of my biological mom. That's very special. Yeah. Um, you've been successful, uh, very successful. You're a successful lawyer in Winnipeg. Uh, you've got a law degree. Uh, you, uh, you're president of the Canadian Bar Association. Have you assimilated? Um, I don't. Uh, honestly, I've never even really thought about that. Uh, I mean, I was raised in a non-Indigenous community. You know, I've, I've, uh, I've had the benefit of um, education in uh, in a non-Indigenous community at a university. You know, University of Manitoba, University of Waterloo. Uh, Certainly, I've had the benefit of those of those experiences. Uh, you know, maybe maybe there was some sort of government policy license by scoop. Well, there was a policy of scooping kids and taking them away from their families and scooping and, and, kids. So in the '60s, yeah, they would take kids. '50s, '60s, '70s, they would take kids. They would pressure mothers to give up their kids. They would just take kids and place them in non-indigenous families. So I mean, that that was. That's, that, that was continuing on the, um, you know, assimilationist policies of, 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 of the government, but, but those policies haven't been successful. Indigenous people are still here. I've, you know, I've made those efforts to reclaim who I am, where I came from. Um, you know, it's, it's still an ongoing process. I'm still, yeah, I'm 53. I'm still learning who I am. I'm still um, learning to interact, you know, and learning more about the community I'm from and the communities uh, that are all around me. Um, but I would say that the assimilationist policies, they failed. Uh, indigenous people were, were and are resilient. 
We're chatting tonight with Brad Regeer. He is the president of the Canadian Bar Association, the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association. We're talking about uh, what happened in Kamloops, uh, what was found in Kamloops uh, uh, a week and a half ago, 215 uh, children's uh, graves. And, uh, and we're talking about Indigenous relations uh, between Canada and our, uh, our brothers and sisters. Uh, um, we're going to take a break and come back in just a minute. More with Brad. Stay with us. Welcome back to the Brian Crabby Radio Hour, Saga 960. We're chatting tonight with Brad Regeer. He is the president of the Canadian Bar Association, which is uh, the organization that uh, represents uh, lawyers across uh, Canada. He's the first Indigenous president. Uh, he's uh, a lawyer in Winnipeg. And Brad, I think what you said is that most of your practice at your law firm is uh, in regards to uh, issues regarding uh, Indigenous rights or claims or or uh, challenges against the government of Canada, etc., which is kind of... Uh, Interesting and ironic, uh, given uh, given your background and given what we're talking about. Um, what do you think should happen now that we've found these 215 children's graves? Well, I uh, we got to bring those kids home to wherever their homes are. We got to find out who they are. They need to go back to their communities. Uh, there can't be any more delays on this. Uh, you know, and, and, and certainly the, the, the Indigenous communities uh, that were impacted by this have to be involved and in leading this. We need to determine uh, how many more of these sites there are across Canada. Uh, and then, you know, the, the, generally what I've heard is that is that to bring those kids to their home communities. Uh, so we should, ha what you're saying obviously is, uh, uh, I'm not sure exactly what the proper terminology is, but exhume them and then what, use DNA um, processes to figure out exactly where they're from? I, I mean, I'm not a... I'm not an expert in that area, but uh, but I, I think we do need to do what we can to identify uh, who these children were, so that uh, so that their families can can bring them home uh, and know what happened to their to their ancestors. I mean, these are these are graves going by. I mean, I don't know when the last one was because they're one they're unmarked. There is such poor record keeping, if any record keeping whatsoever. And then you've got the Catholic Church refusing to disclose records uh to this day they are refusing to disclose records so it, it's it's a it's a huge mystery in terms of, of of who who these children are i mean they they know generally what communities they're going to come from because schools would have children from various communities would have gone to specific schools but um but knowing who they are i mean it, it, it this is this is a uh, this is something that needs to get resolved, uh, that, that needs to be done to help these communities heal. And do you think there's other mass graves? Uh, based on what I have read through the TRC and, and heard, there is most certainly other sites. I mean, I, as I said earlier, there is a, there's, there's one in Brandon, a uh, two hour drive uh, uh, west from me. We, we know there's a site there. You mentioned TRC a, a few times, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Can you tell us a little bit about that? Uh, so the, the Truth and Reconciliation Commission uh, was established, uh, I can't remember the exact year, but they, they began their hearings, their national gatherings began here in Winnipeg in, in 2010. And uh, they, had, uh, they had a large number of them across the country, uh, hearing from survivors, uh, conducting research, um, uh, doing studies that were necessary over the years and then uh, it was it was a five-year process and then they released they released the final report in uh, in 2015 with its 94 calls to action uh, that was led of course by uh, um, former justice and former senator Marie Sinclair and uh, uh, it was um, it was pretty pivotal uh, it was a, it was a, it's, a, it's a very important um, report. Uh, it certainly talks about the Royal Commission and Aboriginal People's Report that was delivered in 1996 and was uh, promptly put on a shelf and ignored by by uh, the governments. Um, this time around, uh, people weren't going to let that happen. And uh, right away, 
I mean, I remember the report. So the report was uh, released and right away you had uh, people across the country, organizations uh, going, okay, we're going to, we're going to read these calls to action. We're going to commit ourselves to these calls to action. And so you, you know, everything from municipal governments to businesses to, for example, the Federation of Law Societies of Canada, the Canadian Bar Association, um, all sorts of organizations, educational institutions, all committing themselves to the calls to action. Uh, so I, I, I think it was it was a pretty pivotal commission, and its report was very pivotal, um, and it really uh, caught the attention uh, of, of Canadian society at large. But while you're probably right. Um, you must be right. Um, I think what re was revealed a week and a half ago has caught attention of Canadian society even more. So it's like we needed to get shocked out of our complacency, did we not? Certainly on this issue, I mean, one of the, one of the volumes of the TRC report is specifically on missing children and unmarked uh, graves. Uh, there's a there's a whole volume on it and i understand there was a recommendation to do this kind of uh of uh research uh, to find out to where those graves were and there's been a shocking lack of funding for it is that not the case there was a proposal while the hearings were going on and this was coming out uh, the trc commissioners made a proposal to the government of canada uh during the process to engage in the um ground penetrating radar searches. And uh, my understanding is that I think it was about one and a half billion dollars to do it at all the sites. And the government said, no, it's too expensive. Uh, we're not going to do it. And TRC, it's out, it's not within your mandate to order this. Uh, so it's, it's not like what is happening, you know, now wasn't called for. It was, it was years ago, but it was ignored. Um, but the TRC did put in six calls to action dealing with this subject area. Uh, and they have that whole separate, that whole, I think it's volume, I think it's volume four of the final report deals with this. So um, it's not like people didn't know that these were out there, uh, but then it took uh, uh, the First Nation, and I can't remember who, I think they partnered with the university, and then they did this work and discovered, uh, discovered all these unmarked graves. So you think that uh, we should uh, return uh, these, uh, um, children, um, um, buried children to their, uh, to their homes, to their home, uh, communities and villages. Um, what else should happen? You know, it's, it's, it's obviously a black mark in Canadian history. Um, what else should happen? Well, um, you know, we've, we've had, some apologies, uh, but there is one apology that is notable and is absent, and that is from the Roman Catholic Church. They have not apologized. The other major churches did, and for reasons I can't fathom, they have just not done so. There was a request all the way up to the Pope to do it, and he refused to do it. Though I, I just read in the news this morning that apparently two Canadian cardinals were meeting with him today, uh, likely as a result of the, you know, uh, the so many calls that the Roman Catholic needs to, needs to apologize. Um, I mean, I, myself, I've said that, uh, you know, in terms of getting this done, the federal government needs to, to step up, but the churches need to step up too. Uh, you know, they, they likely have records on this kind of stuff. And frankly, if it's going to cost money, well, Someone's got to pay for it, and it's not going to be Indigenous people that are going to pay, have to pay for it. They, they, it, it. It's abhorrent to me that there would be an expectation that Indigenous peoples and communities would be required to foot the bill for this kind of um, for the, this kind of work that's that's necessary. So um, let me ask you a question as a lawyer. Uh, you know, there's been lots of uh, suits against different, uh, well, I guess against uh, the Catholic Church and against priests for sexual abuse. But that's been, um, you know, within the last decades, um, is the Catholic Church potentially liable for something that happened 50 or 100 years ago? Well, I'm sure that if we ended up in court, uh, they would argue various limitations, uh, acts and that kind of thing. I mean, 
then we'd have to get into the complicated legal wrangling saying, well, it's an ongoing, uh, it's an ongoing violation and therefore, you know, there, there's still liability. Obviously the individuals, for the most part, I've, I've, I have heard stories that some of the individuals who committed some of these crimes are still living, um, but most of them are gone. So, you know, it's, you know, then we get into the, all sorts of, you know, complicated issues and employment law and vicarious liability and all that kind of stuff. My hope, and, and you know, I'm a lawyer, but I, I don't see long, costly, complicated court cases as the best way to resolve this. The best way to resolve this is for the government and the churches to step up, foot the bill, get this done, have the affected Indigenous communities involved and frankly leading what needs to get done. Uh, that is how this needs to get resolved. And, and we got we got a roadmap for this. It's called the Truth and Reconciliation Commission's final report. It's got 94 calls to action. Uh, six of them deal with this issue. So let's get them implemented. Brad, obviously um, dealing with this, particularly given what uh, was found a week and a half ago in Kamloops is, is of, of importance. But isn't, you know, improving the lives of, of current uh, um, people in our Indigenous uh, communities uh, even more important. And, you know, we talked about drinking water, um, alcoholism is an issue, drug abuse is an issue, education is an issue, job opportunities are an issue, disproportionate uh, percentage um, in, the, in the, the penal system, the way the legal system deals with them. What, what do you think we need to do from a a systemic standpoint in regards to the way that Canadians and, or not Canadians, but Canada um, uh, deals with uh, its indigenous community? Well, you know, uh, we've got the 94 calls to action, pretty good roadmap, you know, from what I've seen. So, and, and it deals with all of these areas. Um, you know, it's not, it's not just specific to one area. It cut those 94 covers so many areas. Uh, we have the calls to justice from the missing and murdered and indigenous women and girls report that's two years old uh, this week. Uh, there was, there was, I think, over 200 calls to justice. Got a couple of maps in front of us that that are pretty comprehensive and deal with a whole lot of issues. So we we, we had these commissions. We appointed experts to lead them. They had experts helping them. They heard the testimony. They delivered the reports. Seems to me. Maybe we should focus on that, and then we and 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 those calls to action. They deal with child welfare. They deal with criminal justice system. They deal with uh, healing families. Like I, I, so many things. So why don't we start? You know, and there has been some implementation, but let's get let's get these things implemented. How do we do that? There doesn't seem to be, at least historically, there hasn't seemed to have been a commitment to it. Um, well, there needs to be political will to do this. Uh, there, there needs to be uh, the resources put to this. And um, frankly, I think, uh, in my view, Canadians can, uh, can help out with this by telling your MP, telling your MLA, get this done. Get these things implemented. Uh, no more excuses, no more delay. I think there's uh, been a outpouring of, of grief, um, you know, with the, uh, the children's sneakers put outside, um, people's uh, attention to this issue. Uh, and, you know, it's terrible to say, but isn't this the time um, where people are paying attention to it? Like almost never, uh, no, no other time for someone like you and other people like you to really, uh, you know, put people's focus on it and call attention to it and uh, and really change the the direction of our relationship with our Indigenous communities. That's uh, what I've been trying to do as CBA president for the last nine months. I made this uh, uh, a personal priority as president to draw attention to this. Um, the discovery a week and a half ago was not what I was expecting to have happened. Um, it's been... Uh, it's been an emotional week and a half for so many people, um, uh, myself included. Uh, 
but uh, you know, if Canadians really want um, want this re the relationship between Canada and the Indigenous peoples of this land, um, then then put that pressure on your MPs, on your MLAs, on your local governments. Um, we want this. We want this done. We want the relationship to be to be healed and to be made better. We're chatting tonight with Brad Regeer. He is the president of the Canadian Bar Association, the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association. We're talking about uh, the discovery of 215 um, children in uh, in unmarked graves uh, at a Catholic uh, a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia, a week and a half ago. We're going to take a break and come back with some concluding comments in just a minute. Stay with us. Well, we're back with Brad Regeer, who is the president of the Canadian Bar Association, the first Indigenous president of the Canadian Bar Association, uh, a lawyer in Winnipeg, uh, someone that uh, has had his own uh, interesting life journey. Um, and uh, we're talking about uh, what happened in uh, uh, Kamloops a week and a half ago, the discovery of 215 graves, unmarked graves for children uh, at a residential school. Uh, Brad, you know, it's interesting. I've spoken to a couple of people this past uh, week and a half, and people have talked about how Canadians haven't had the kind of appreciation of, uh, of Indigenous culture and the richness of Indigenous culture that maybe we should. Um, and that that's part of the problem. Um, and, uh, you know, commenting about uh, uh, someone sent me a, a wonderful, um, you know, description of some of the spiritual laws of uh, one of the Indigenous communities. Another one um, described uh, some of the, the cultural, the significance of some of the cultural activities. Uh, someone else said that we should do a show on the beauty of Indigenous art. Have we missed out? as Canadians in, in understanding, you know, another wonderful culture, you know, this the idea of assimilation really, you know, clearly was wrong, but, but the opposite of it about understanding how beautiful another culture can be and how rich and how it can benefit us and how it could be part of our definition as, as Canadians. What do you think? Um, you know, I, 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 we certainly weren't, and maybe it's different now, but certainly when I was going to elementary school, you know, primary, secondary school, we weren't taught anything about indigenous culture in, in the school system. It was, uh, if there was anything, it was usually in history and it was, uh, you know, primarily stuff about the, you know, the, the wars out in the Eastern part of the continent. Uh, and then it was like uh, indigenous people didn't exist anymore. Um, so, uh, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm aware of lots of in schooling now where a lot of that has changed. Uh, but indigenous peoples, uh, first of all, they're not, they're not uniform. There's so many different communities. There's, you know, there's Métis communities, there's Inuits, there's uh, all the First Nation communities. Uh, they're so varied across the country. Um, all have their unique um, uh, cultures, their, 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 languages, um, uh, how they express themselves in art and dance, um, all those different ways. Uh, you know, if you haven't, if you haven't experienced that, uh, I think you are missing out um, because they're just, they're so, they're, they're so unique and they are tied to this land. It's not like they were developed somewhere else and then brought here. Um, which is what you have with every other culture here. It's they, they are part of this, that culture is part of this land. Um, it's beautiful, it's wonderful. Um, but the other thing that people should also remember is that uh, indigenous cultures uh, are also need to be allowed to evolve. Uh, everyone else's culture you know, is, is permitted to evolve. They're not frozen in time. Um, and, and, and that's part of the beauty. The beauty of it and uh you know certainly I've, I've seen more and more people embracing it I, the art that we put on our walls or, or or sculptures um uh but uh but yeah i mean if you can if you can find a way to experience it uh i, I encourage everyone it, 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 i think it actually helps indigenous people it, it uh it, and it helps that relationship brad in a couple of years when we look back at uh, at uh, May 
2021 and the finding of uh, this uh, these graves. How do you think this will be remembered? Will this be a catalyst for change? Will it be a uh, a catalyst for for recrimination and uh, dispute and hatred? What what what's the impact of this going to be a couple of years from now? I'm I'm hoping that you know whether it's a year from now when I'm no longer president, I'm just uh, you know average Joe lawyer back to my uh, my work there. I, I I hope I'm looking back at this and this has become a catalyst for change. Um, you know we've we've had a number of things. We've had the TRC reports. We've had the missing and murdered Indigenous women and girls report. Those have been catalysts for change. And I'm hoping that this is yet another agent of that change and and moves this relationship on. Um, in the in, to the place it needs to go, and um, and that you know you know whether it's in Kamloops or whether it's in other sites which are you know they're going to be found that the, the, that has been resolved um, that has been resolved and that those affected Indigenous communities are 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 happy and satisfied in terms of the resolution of that. Brad Regeer, president of the Canadian Bar Association. Thank you so much for joining us uh, today and chatting with us about your uh, thoughts um, about this tragedy uh, that uh, that was discovered that uh, didn't happen um, a week and a half ago, but it was discovered a week and a half ago at a residential school in Kamloops, British Columbia. Really appreciate uh, you joining us. Thank you. Thanks, Brian. You know, if I could just uh, end with a final thought, um, I do think that this is uh, Canada's original sin. Um, and uh, we too often think about ourselves in this sort of superior attitude toward America and, uh, and how uh, Americans have treated uh, African-Americans. Um, and I think we have our own uh, very bad history about how we've treated uh, uh, Blacks, African Canadians uh, in Canada. But I think our treatment of, of Indigenous peoples, First Nations people, um, is something that we've got to come to terms with and uh and we've got to change and we've got to make amends for the past and we've got to improve their lives um uh, dramatically and uh and and it's it should be our responsibility for our brothers and sisters uh on this land of canada and uh and i think brad is an incredibly good example of uh of a spokesperson um, but there's lots of other people um uh and uh we should be listening um, and, um, and we should change. And uh, I hope this travesty is a catalyst to having that happen. Anyway, that's our show for tonight. Thanks for joining us, Brad. Really appreciate your time. Thank you.